Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today in our Philip Securities Research Weekly Morning Call. Today, we have a few stock counter updates, including the results from Netflix, as well as the usual technical analysis, which will be then followed by the usual macro and sector outlook that includes the US Bank results as well as the Singapore Weekly. So, without further ado, I hand over the time to Jonathan to run through the results on Netflix. Thank you. Thanks, Max. And good morning, everyone. Uh, so I'll just be running through Netflix's second quarter 2023 results. Uh, we issued a report this morning titled Page Sharing Driving Most of the Gains. Uh, so when you look at the results, um, the second quarter results were roughly in line with our expectations. Um, when you look at revenue, uh, revenue grew almost about 3%. Um, and, and this is, I mean, it's not great uh, in terms of growth uh, wise, but uh, it is a little bit better than the last couple of quarters when, when growth was basically flat. Um, what contributed to this was a 3% year-on-year decline in average prices, uh, as well as a 6%, uh, oh, sorry, but, but it was offset by a 6% uh, year-on-year increase in average paid memberships. Uh, so uh, it's a little bit different when you look at uh, the paid membership, the actual paid membership number at the bottom. Uh, you can see an 8% growth, and this is because it just takes the final uh, number of, of uh, subscribers at the end of the quarter and then compare it back to the, the, the final over uh, the second quarter of 2022. Uh, the key thing for this quarter is actually operating income. So operating income uh, saw a 16% year-on-year growth. Uh, and, and this was mainly due to a delay in content spend, uh, especially as there was a writer and actor strike. Um, more, the, the writer strike was a little bit longer, so it is still ongoing. Uh, whereas the, the actor strike actually just happened, I guess, towards the end of the quarter. And so what this essentially does is that, um, uh, you know, because writers and actors are on strike, you know, production isn't really going uh, ongoing. Uh, so what we're seeing is that, that uh, these anticipated uh, spending in, in content production has now actually been pushed uh, into the next uh, few quarters, or at least until the, the strikes kind of uh, uh, subside. Uh, and so what, what we can also see that is that moving down the line, you know, operating margin was, was uh, saw a huge increase at 22.3%, and then uh, Pat Me also saw some growth. Earnings per share uh, beat uh, its own company guidance by about 16-17%. So quite a significant uh, a beat for the quarter. Uh, the main positive uh, was uh, it's the company's key initiatives are, are actually starting to show positive results. So there were two main uh, initiatives. The first is page sharing, uh, which essentially is like your password crackdown. Um, so Netflix is making it a lot more difficult for uh, borrowers of, of passwords to actually access uh, the accounts. Uh, by introducing like, OTPs and stuff like that. Uh, in the future, es essentially what they really want to do is to uh, completely block your IP so that you can't use it unless you have a main account uh, a link to that particular I IP address or, or, or a certain few uh, devices. And so what the company is actually seeing right now is that, you know, because it's making it a little bit more difficult for these borrowers to, to log in and to watch their shows, uh, they're seeing sort of a spillover uh, where some of these borrowers are actually just signing up for for Netflix memberships, and, and that's been a, and that's most of the gains that we've seen for this quarter. Uh, when you look at your eight percent year on year growth in paid memberships, uh, and about six million new members for the quarter, most of this is coming from um, its paid uh, sharing initiative. Um, so what we expect to see is that over the next few quarters, as more and more uh, borrowers start to to uh, feel the inconvenience, uh, and then they'll gradually shift over and, and perhaps purchase their own uh, uh, membership account. Uh, the second is ad-supported uh, plan, which is essentially you know, advertising revenue. Right now, it, it's still very marginal because it's still in its initial stages. Uh, but in terms of the members that are actually on this plan, uh, quarter on quarter, uh, memberships actually double, uh, which is quite a good sign. So, so a lot of people are actually taking up these, these new memberships. Uh, and this is important because every member on this plan is actually margin equitative. Uh, because when, when you break in the advertising revenue that they get from it, um, it's actually better than uh, a member just on a, a, a basic, uh, and even a standard plan, I believe. Um, the, the unique economics from, from ad supported is actually a little bit better than your, your, your standard plan on Netflix. Uh, so, so quite important for, for margin expansion over here. Uh, in terms of the negatives, like I mentioned earlier, um, I guess the, the, the strikes are negative in terms of publicity, right? Uh, but it actually caused a temporary, you know, positive 
uh, on your your margins as well as your free cash flow because you're you're just uh, the company is just kind of delaying a lot of the spending, moving it into next year and, and so on. Uh, so it did help financials, but it is a negative when you look at it from the uh, entertainment industry as a whole. You know, we're not, still not quite sure how uh, what the public will perceive of this uh, as as the strikes drag on for for longer. Uh, in terms of the outlook, uh, revenue growth was is expected to be for the for the third, third quarter is expected to be around eight percent year on year. And this is guidance from the company. Uh, and earnings growth expected to be about 13, 14% year on year. So, so quite significant uh, uh, growth in terms of both top line and bottom line. Um, they also increased their free cash flow guidance for the full year of 2023. Uh, they increased it from 1.5 billion to about 5 billion. So it's quite a significant increase. Uh, and this is predominantly because you know, they're not spending as much money on content. So they've got a bit more free cash flow. Um, and they also did mention that they're going to uh, increase the, uh, or at least accelerate the, the the rate of its share buybacks, uh, because it's operating at, at uh, slightly above its its own optimal uh, cash levels, uh, so you can see a little bit more value, I guess, uh, generated back to 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 shareholders through share buybacks in the second half of this year. Uh, in terms of our valuations, we actually maintain a neutral valuation, a uh, neutral rating, uh, but we raised the target price to four hundred forty six dollars from three hundred eighty eight dollars. Um, the main reason why we raised it is because we reduced uh, twenty twenty three content spend by about twelve percent. Um, and we, we also reduced uh, longer term content spend by about 2% to be more in line with, with revenue growth. Um, we also increased our 2024 revenue and PADME uh, estimates by about 3%, uh, mainly because we think that there'll be this uh, follow through uh, uh, positive benefits from page sharing as well as uh, you know, consistent growth in ad supported revenue. Uh, we, we, in terms of our, our weighted average cost of capital, we, we keep it the same at 12.2% uh, and the terminal growth rate at 3%. Uh, so that's all for next Netflix. I'll move on to Tesla, Philip on the ground. Um, so Tesla also announced their second quarter 2023 earnings uh, last week. Um, we don't cover this uh, uh, company, so we have no rating on it. The stock last closed at $260.02. Uh, so Tesla, just a brief background, they're, they're almost $1 trillion in market cap, $830 billion. Uh, they are EV manufacturer. That's their main business. They also manufacture batteries, uh, uh, renewable energy uh, sources, and um, they also do have their own services. So they do insurance, uh, they do their own servicing, uh, and they also do have uh, their own software, uh, which is essentially their, their full self-driving uh, platform. Uh, in terms of revenue growth for the second quarter, uh, this number was $25 billion, uh, So it was a, almost a 50% year-on-year growth, so, so quite significant. Uh, Patme came in at 2.7 billion, which is 20% year on year growth. Uh, the main thing for Tesla is that actually their gross margins declined by almost 7% uh, from a quarter ago. Uh, the main reasons for this is because they actually cut uh, a lot of their uh, prices in their EV several times in the first half of this year. So towards the back end of the first quarter and, and, and uh, definitely through the second quarter, uh, they, they cut pr prices quite significantly. Uh, the main reason for this is because um, raw uh, material prices were actually coming down and Tesla doesn't really want to, uh, their main goal is actually trying to make uh, cars, their, their EVs more affordable to mass market. Uh, and so they don't really, they, they're kind of fo focusing more on volume rather than uh, operating leverage in, in terms of uh, EV manufacturing. So, so they don't really have an incentive to keep uh, margins high, um, uh, I guess because that's not their main goal. Uh, in terms of deliveries, well, the company saw about 466,000 uh, deliveries for the quarter, which is the highest of all time in any single quarter. Uh, and this is almost double compared to last year's second quarter because there was a, a factory shutdown uh, in China, the yeah, 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 uh, Shanghai Giga factory. And so you know, it's got a bit of lumpiness there because uh, right now, you know, the factory is back in, in almost full capacity, uh, hence the, the huge increase in deliveries. Um, what was interesting was also that Model Y, which is their mass market SUV, uh, was actually the best selling vehicle globally in the first quarter of 2023. Uh, so it beat out a lot of your long time uh, um, uh, uh, car models like your Toyota Camry and Toyota Corolla. Uh, essentially, in the top five, it's Model Y, and then the next four are your Toyota models, your Camry, Corolla. Uh, I believe there's a, a, a Rev4 in there and stuff. And, and, just the, all other Toyota Camry models. So this is quite interesting because um, you can see, you know, that there's this rapid adoption of uh, uh, EV vehicles kind of going on right now. Uh, in terms of the, the actual, you know, uh, electric vehicles, uh, revenue, stood, revenue grew about 50%. Um, 
and this continued to be a record, especially as uh, factories, the bigger the factories continue to increase their ramp. So, and this is something we, we should, I guess, over the lower one, we expect to see continue to grow, especially as uh, demand is no issue for Tesla. They've always said over their calls that they have too much demand, uh, not enough supply to keep up, not enough capacity. So they're working really hard on uh, increasing capacity uh, to fulfill uh, a lot of the orders. Um, the other two, I guess, main businesses in energy storage and services are, are relatively small in terms of revenue contribution, but are showing uh, significant growth as well. Uh, the, the latest news is that uh, um, Tesla actually signed a couple of, of deals for its superchargers to allow other OEM manufacturers like Cities Benz, uh, Ford and GM to use uh, their infrastructure network. So this will only be, it will only serve as more uh, income and, and this kind of falls under their services and other categories. Uh, so we should continue, continue to see you know, very strong growth in, in all these other uh, uh, categories. Uh, in terms of their outlook, uh, Tesla did also mention that the third quarter is going to be a little bit weak uh, in terms of deliveries and production, um, and mainly because they're doing some factory upgrades to, to a few of their, their uh, EV production factories. Um, but it also reiterated, reiterated that, that long-term, their long-term target of about 50% Kager production uh, is still remaining intact. And for this year, they still expect about 1.8 million uh, vehicles for 2023. So, so a significant increase. Um, and you can see significant ramp moving forward. Uh, the main, I guess, margin expansion, they expect to come from uh, its software. So uh, it's full self-driving software. Uh, and, and they're trying to monetize this as uh, FSD starts to ramp up. It gets a little bit better uh, using AI and machine learning. Um, and so they are in talks to, to at least uh, outsource their, their software uh, to other OEM manufacturers as well as to its own customers uh, on either a subscription basis or like a one-time payment. I believe one-time payment right now is about 15000 um for FSD. Uh, they, the, the, I guess the other th key thing that, that people are very hyped about is the Cybertruck deliveries that are expected to come in towards the end of this year. You can see right here the picture um, is a picture of a Cybertruck surrounded by a lot of the, the factory workers. Um, and why it's highly anticipated is because it's been delayed for so long. Uh, it was expected to come out, I guess, three years ago. Um, but then since COVID happened, there were a lot of disruptions. Um, and so there were you know, a lot of delays in, in this project. But as it starts to, to kind of uh, uh, ramp up its production and start being, making deliveries, you should be able to see it on the roads uh, sooner rather than later. I'm not sure if it'll come to Singapore, but definitely we'll see it on the roads in the US. Uh, so that's all for uh, my Philip on the ground for Tesla. Uh, I'll hand it over to Max for Oh My Home. Thank you. Thanks, John. So we hosted Oh My Home for a guest webinar last week, and this is the Philip on the ground. Uh, just as a disclaimer, this counter is not rated. So just as a brief background, Oh My Home is a Singapore-based property technology company <laughs> that is uh, that aims to be a one-stop shop for property related services. And it is listed on a NASDAQ with a market cap of around 16 million US dollars. It operates in three countries, with Singapore being its major markets, and it also has presence in Malaysia, and it has actually recently expanded into the Philippines. Um, in terms of the segments, the company has two, which are the brokerage services as well as the emerging and other services. For the brokerage business, the company is uh, similar to uh, uh, the, other the other property agencies such as your ERA and Propnex, but the differentiating factor is that the company tries to be more technologically oriented, which I will explain a little later on. So <clears throat> for the brokerage business, the company will assign its in-house uh, property agents to customers to provide end-to-end uh, end uh, assistance for the transaction process. So this will include things like taking pictures and videos of the properties for, for listing purposes, as well as uh, they are going to help you during your uh, documentation documentation and negotiation process, as well as the checklist uh, review. And, and then for the imaging and other services, this, in, this, this business covers the add-on services, which are typically on an ad hoc basis. So this includes things like your mortgage and insurance referrals. Uh, customers can also actually book uh, uh, look for recommended law firms for property-related uh, issues from oh My Home. And they can also book services such as your renovation, handyman, and cleaning as well from the platform. So in terms of the revenue model, uh, for the brokerage business, Oh My Home earns revenue by uh, charging commission fees based on the value of the property that is being transacted through the platform. Uh, the company indicated that about 80% of the properties that are transacted through the platforms are actually HDBs. 
and they charge a commission fee of up to 2% for HDB transaction. If, uh, uh, the company, uh, Oh My Home actually charges a commission fee of up to 3% for private properties. And then for emerging, for the emerging and other services business, the company charges referral fees for their partner service providers. And they also charge their customers uh, service fees depending on the type of service that the customer purchase. So this is kind of similar to what you do with the conventional contractors. Uh, as I mentioned just now, Oh My Home tries to differentiate itself from the other uh, major property agencies such as your ERA and Propnex by being more technologically oriented. And what and one way they do that is the it's through their proprietary in-house algorithm, which they call Match. So what this Match algorithm does is essentially they will aggregate all the data from qualified buyers. Uh, qualified buyers meaning those who have obtained the in principle approval as well as those who are already aware of how much monthly mortgage they need to pay. So, uh, so uh, because and then the data they collect are those uh, are those on the type of properties that the buyers are looking at, the regions that they're considering, as well as the budgets, and what and then all of and all of this data will be matched to the um, will be matched with the listings that are already available on the platform, and because these qualified buyers are considered to be more serious buyers, they tend to offer more attractive prices to the sellers, which increases the chances of them. Uh, getting accepted. This will, uh, in the end, translate into higher matching success rate and therefore increase the transaction speed. Oh, my home actually claims that it is able to sell a property within seven days, which is far faster than the uh, uh, average of 130 plus days that it takes for a typical conventional freelance uh, property agent. And then the second technology they introduced during the webinar was Homer AI. So Homer AI is essentially an AI-based tool that tells you the mar latest market data on the HDB unit that you own. So it will tell it will tell you the estimated up to date and market price of your unit as well as the recent uh, transaction that occurs uh, in your surrounding areas. So uh, unfortunately, they didn't really go through the financials that much during the call. But in terms of the financials, they report on a half yearly basis. So they will only report their first half twenty three results in August. For FY22, their revenue actually grew by 60% to $7 million. And this is mainly driven by the strong growth in its emerging and other services market, particularly for the revenue vision services. The company recorded a gross margin of 33%, which is uh, much higher than your typical uh, property agents, which has a gross margin of about 10%. However, despite the strong revenue growth and the uh, high gross margin, they still recorded a net loss of $3 million last year, and this is mainly attributed to the fact that they are still continuing to invest in improving their technological capability. So that's all for Oh My Home. Now I hand over the time to Glenn to run through the results of the US banks. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Max. Yeah, so for... Yeah, next slide, yes. So I'll just do a quick uh, recap of the US... Uh, banks, the top four US banks at least, the uh, second quarter 23 results which were released uh, just over a week ago. And just to reiterate that uh, we don't have any coverage, we don't have any coverage over these banks and hence there's no rating for them or target price. Okay, so just a, just a quick overview, we can see that the net interest income in the first rate box here, it's, it has grown uh, quite significantly for all four banks as they are still uh, sort of uh, reaping the benefits from the high interest rate environment. Um, however, uh, for their non-interest income, we can see that you know there's a big uh, uh, sort of like a saw thumb that is sticking out here, which is the city group. And this is mainly from the drop, continued decline in the investment banking, which fell 31%. Whereas the other three banks have sort of uh, normalized their investment banking segment, and you know, JP Morgan is only down like 5%, while the other two banks are actually showing an improvement year on year. So this is the big uh, sort of thing that made uh, Citigroup's uh, revenue actually decline. So if you see it, the revenue, Citigroup had a, had a decline year on year of 1%, while the other three banks all showed uh, quite significant double-digit improvements in their revenue. Now moving on to the next point would be the provisions change. So provisions change, I'll just explain a bit what, how I came up with this number. It's uh, the increase from the year-on-year -year increase, the year-on-year -year increase for the for second quarter. So a higher number means that the provisions have increased. So for a positive number as well. So for all four banks, they showed that it, the provisions have sort of uh, normalized from the previous year in 2022 and it's starting to increase and go back to this 
normalized figure. And you know, I think for going forward, we should expect that this number will also continue to increase as uh, you know from the high interest rate environment and the loans as well. And you know, respectively, with what happened for the second quarter, we can see that the three banks, JP Morgan, Bank of America, and Wells Fargo, have shown significant improvements. Uh, some of them, both of them are over 60% increase in their PADME, while Bank of America has 20% increase. And, but Citigroup fell short, and this is mainly from their investment banking segment where it continued to decline. So looking forward, we do expect that the net interest income will continue to grow for at least the next quarter, but we might see a drop off as the high interest, as the benefits from the high interest rate environment start to plateau. And there might also be a further increase in their provisions, mainly due to the you know, to a higher risk of MPL and you know the high interest rate environment, <coughs> excuse me, the high interest rate environment as well. And you know, there's a chance, there's a risk that the that their customers may not be able to sort of uh, uh, on uh, pay their loans on <coughs> excuse me, uh, sort of service their loans on time. So that's all I have for the banks, the US banks, I'll now hand it over to Meow Meow. Thanks. Thank you, Gun. Uh, so, Sambana Industrial Re released the result last week. Next slide, please. Yeah, we don't cover the company, so it's not rated. It's an industrial rate with 18 properties in Singapore, which mainly in the high-tech industrial, warehouse, and logistics sector, and sum up to 474 million market cap. A few things to highlight for the result briefing. In first half or two, three, they achieved record rental reversion of 20.1% year on year, which translates into 23.2% increase in gross revenue. But NPI only increased by 0.5% year on year due to the surging utility cost. However, the management also shared that they have pretty much hashed all the utility costs and also partnering with Capital for solar panel installation, which will help to stabilize the operating costs going forward. And DPO in first half to three was 1.61 cents, which we increased 1.1% in young year. And some key operating metrics to be noted of uh, will be the total, oper uh, total portfolio occupancy is now at 93.9%. Which increased 2.6% year on year, driving by the logistics sector. Gearing is now at 32.5%, with 3.89% financing cost, the absolute amount increased by 18.9% year on year. We also attended the analyst briefing regarding cost requisition letter. There will be two resolutions to be voted during the extraordinary general meeting on 7th August to internalize the rate manager. Resolution one is stream as the to be removed as the manager, which is the current management team, Sabana Red uh, Estate Investment Management. Yeah. And our uh, resolution two is incorporating a subsidiary wholly owned by the trustee and appointing such to be the manager of Sabana Industrial Rate. So both are ordinary resolution, which requires 50% of the shareholders' approval and is by shares uh, instead of hands. If either of the resolution are passed, the trustee will be directed by unit holders to remove stream as the manager or set up the internalized management structure. The current management also shared that there are some risks arising, arising from the resolutions. Firstly, the removal of stream as the management would result in mandatory prepayment of all outstanding loans. So HSBC, UOB, Maybank, and CMB are their principal bankers. Secondly, the requisition letter lacks clarity as to the practical steps that need to be taken after the resolution are passed. And that's all for Sabana. I'll now hand over to Darren. Yeah, thanks, Mamel. So Manulife US Street, they announced that their property devalued by about 14.6%. Yeah, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so the property uh, devalued from the for first half 23, which is uh, for six months, from December 22 to June 23, it, uh, dropped 14.6% or about 280 million. So the, on the right side is the exact uh, valuation decline. As you can see uh, five of the properties which is uh, inside the red box. Those are the bigger decliners, which decline more than 30 over percent. Uh, sorry, not uh, 30 over million US dollars. 
but the decline is across the board as we saw higher discount rates, cap rates and higher vacancies as well as a slower leasing momentum across the whole US office space. However, because of this uh, breach, I mean, how, because of this property devaluation or asset de devaluation, their gearing is now at 57%. And this exceeds the 50% the level if your interest coverage ratio is above 2.5%. But then um, because the, the property, de because this gearing increase is due to circumstances beyond the manager's control, which is the property devaluation, it's not considered as a breach of the financial uh, uh, leverage. They just need to bring down the gearing, and they cannot do any. They cannot raise any more funds. Basically, they just they can only refinance their loans. So that's the only uh, thing for that for the financial leverage part. However, because of this, uh, they they breached in some of the financial co covenants, the loan covenants, and the thing that they actually breached is the unencumbered debt to the unencumbered assets. It cannot be more than sixty percent. This is the loan covenant covenant from the banks. So right now, their asset. Their, their ratio now is at 60.2%. And the key thing for them is they are seeking waiver to, to waive this breach from the lenders. So what will happen if they don't get the waiver is that it will result in a cross default of Manulife's interest rate swaps, at, which is right now their interest rate swaps are at fixed rate. So if the so-called this uh, is a breach and they didn't get a waiver, all their, their interest rate swaps are deemed to be invalid and all they will have to pay a variable variable rate loans on all of their their outstanding loans, variable rate interest rates on their outstanding loans rather, and and this probably will help will bring their ICR to under two, if in that case in, in the case that they they, are, they default on all these interest rate swaps, so um, right now for them the key thing between now and the first half to issue results which is probably in the the early uh, in August or two, two weeks time is that they need to get a waiver. So what will happen if they don't get a waiver is that it will be unlikely that they can pay out any distributions because the bankers will not allow them to pay out the distributions. And if they don't pay out distributions, it will impact the tax structure of menu life as well. And it will require them to pay additional taxes if they don't uh, declare any distributions. So what menu life can do right now is in the near term, they can sell the flip tower to the sponsor. There's been some delay, so uh, that can help to uh, give Manulife some leverage. And they also can get a loan from sponsor, but that won't exactly help to lower their, their gearing. And right now for them, an equity fundraising is highly unlikely because of the share price. And as well as all, all the situation they are, they are in, is, is almost, yeah, it's almost impossible for them to do any EFR at the moment. So these are some of the challenges that many life we are facing. Yeah, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, and we visited a Goko Meet Town. It was a site visit last week. So these are just some highlights and some pictures. So basically, Goko Meet Town is a mixed integrated development comprising of premium grade A offices, a retail spaces, and two residences, and it's along Beach Road. Uh, Goko Meet Town is a 30 story office tower with about 700,000 square foot of net uh, lettable area, net lettable area, NLA, and each floor is about 30, has about 30 square foot. And the rents are 11 to about 13 PSF, and it's about 80% occupied at the moment. So it uh, till uh, early, earlier in the year. And their leasing strategy is not to have an anchor tenant, unlike other buildings like uh, the upcoming IOI Central Boulevard Tower, they have designed Amazon as an anchor tenant. So right now for this Coco Midtown, the largest tenant is uh, PIL uh, Pacific. Uh, PIL for, for the term, but it's PIL. Yeah. Uh, so they occupy 2.5 floors. Um, and the, the, the average tenant will probably occupy about 1 to 1 1.5 floors, which is about 30 to about 45,000 uh, square foot. Yeah, and they also have many amenities there. For, for use of all the, the tenants, office tenants. Like they have a 40 meter swimming pool, as you can see in the, the picture on the right. They have showers, lockers, changing rooms. You also can barbecue there, but they have barbecue pits and they have a running track as well. And near the Goku Meet Town, there is a network hub. So this network hub is like a kind of an extension to the Goku Meet Town the office building. It has flexible spaces for, for short term use. 
and they have uh, office suits as well for short-term leasing and meeting spaces for probably ad hoc use. Yeah. And near there, there is uh, two residences, a Midtown Bay and Midtown Modern. And for their retail space, they have at Google Midtown is their anchor, one of the anchor tenants is Paul Singapore. They're going to set up a showroom there. And they have a new, uh, they, they, they plan to do some new things at the, the Paul showroom. So that, uh, like some F and B new F and B concept as well inside the showroom, so that will uh, more more news on that to, to come. And the thing is, Gokumi Town is that it's sitting right directly above Bugis MRT, so this is well connected to public transport. Yeah. And, uh, next slide, please. Yeah. The next slide, they will have some pictures. So on the left side, that's a the picture of Midtown Bay from level twenty nine. So we are brought to level 29. Level 29 is the top floor. It's still uh, vacant for now. Uh, you can see the right side. Right side is the right picture is the how an, a typical office level will look like. That was level 29. It's, it's vacant. And the middle picture is a view of National Stadium from level 29. And the, the left picture is the view of Midtown Bay from level 29 as well. Yeah, so that's all for the site visit note. I will now hand over time to Peggy. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. Um, morning. Uh, we'll talk about Fortress Minerals today. Uh, we met the company. Can, can we have this next slide, please? Yeah. This is a Philip on the ground. Uh, Fortress Mineral is a miner. Is, they mine iron ore. Their mines are in Malaysia, uh, in Bukit Bersi. Uh, this is one of the two listed iron ore mining companies in, on Singapore market. The other one is Southern Alliance. But the valuations are vastly different. Uh, also, another point to note is Southern Alliance. Uh, it has uh, recently announced that they, they are into go, go getting into mining of rare earths, so they are they are getting to look very different now. Okay. The the assets of Fortress they have a uh, three three mini three assets. One is a thirteen year uh, mining rights uh, that's expiring in twenty thirty three. That that covers five point four million metric tons of uh, inferred and indicated resource resource. They had in F522 acquired four mining leases in Makapu, also in Malaysia. This Makapu will only contribute significantly, meaningfully, when the processing plant is ready by early 2025. And they had also acquired two exploration projects in Sabah. These projects, uh, they, is, they expect to be able to find copper, nickel, and cobalt. These are the materials that are used for electric vehicle. But this is an exploration license. They will make, need to make, they will need to make a decision as to whether they will drill or drop the projects by December 2024. So if they find anything, uh, any meaningful resource in there, they will then apply for a drilling license. In the first half net profit fell 40%, mainly because the price of iron ore was down. For them, the ASP, drops 12%, we we'll refer to the table on the right. The 12% the decline in ASP to $104 US dollar per metric ton. This, this, um, this selling price is lower than market price because that excludes the, the freight on board. They, they still, they managed to produce 4% higher output in, the, in this quarter. And, but the cost, the average cost of sales have gone up to the five dollars US dollar per metric ton. This is twelve percent higher than the same quarter last year. Uh, that's because they included the cost that they incurred in Sabah for exploration and the and the cost they incurred at Makabu. And both both are not contributing as yet. So if we extrude all these costs, the the average cost drops to twenty five dollars per US dollar per ton. The management still expect to achieve a higher output for FY24. We think it's going to be uh, hover, hovering at about mid single digit level. They, their mines are selling to their, their products and all are, sell, are sold to the steel mines, steel mills in, in Malaysia, and who then after uh, the, the products, the end products are sold to the domestic market as well as to other Asian countries such as Vietnam, Indonesia, and the Philippines. Still, still they, uh, iron ore is a, is a commodity. The prices that the, manage, the fortress can achieve is still very much dependent on the market price of iron ore out there. 
And of course, the bigger players are those the Australian miners like the BHP and so on. Yeah. So the outlook for, for Fortress will be driven mainly also by the outlook for steel production in China, especially in China, who is the biggest consumption uh, consumer and product, producer of steel, accounting for more than 50% of the world's output. Uh, and the three industries uh, to watch are the construction, automobile, and heavy machineries. And, and of course, China property sector and China construction infrastructure development will be a key, uh, key data to track for, for the fortune of, for, of fortress minerals. And that's, that's all for me for Fortress. I pass it on to Zane for the technicals. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Peggy. Good morning, everyone. So now I'll be covering on the technicals. Uh, next slide. So looking at S&P 500, uh, what I did was a test of the 4,450 uh, resistance, which was the resistance of two uh, uptrend channels as shown in the chart. So uh, this week, wise, we could see a little bit of a pullback to maybe test the 4,500 level, uh, which is also like the uptrend channel uh, support. So currently, there's the, the immediate resistance lies between 4,450 to about 4,630, or the current support is around 4,550 to about 4,500. Uh, next slide. So in our uh, latest market trend analysis report, we looked at the relationship between some of the technical indicators, such as uh, your put call ratio, your uh, AAII, uh, bull bear spread, as well as the VIX, uh, the, the correlation with the S&P 500 for the last decade. So the report is titled, uh, there's little evidence these indicators are actually acting as the indicators for S&P 500. So the first thing we look at is the put call ratio. So a high put call ratio suggests that the uh, market is overly bearish because the number of the, there's a lot of people buying puts as compared to calls. So when we divide it, the ratio is very high. And conversely, the low ratio suggests that uh, there's actually some sort of uh, exuberance in the market. So this is the chart that shows the relationship between the put call ratio and the S&P 500. So put call ratio is in orange and blue, S&P 500 is in blue. You can see that uh, whenever the ratio spikes above 0 0.8, um, most of the time there's a, there's a, there's a good chance that S&P 500 will climb in a, in a few months afterwards. So such as in 2016, uh, 2019, 2020, as well as uh, late in December of last year, where it spiked to very high levels of above uh, 1.2. And we saw a very, they saw like a rally uh, took place uh, in this year. Whereas uh, when there's a very low ratio, such as 0 0.6, <clears throat> we suggest that um, market is actually, uh, there's a lot of bullish sentiment in the market. Uh, doesn't mean, that, that doesn't necessarily mean that S&P will uh, go lower afterwards such as in 2016, 2017, um, 2018, you can see that uh, the ratio has been hovering around the 0 0.6 mark, but the broad market-wise has been rallying uh, very well. And then in 2021, 20, sorry, 2020 as well, uh, the market also rallied uh, quite a bit. Yeah, uh, next slide. So the next indicator we looked at was the AAII bull bear spread. So for a start, the AAII sentiment survey actually asked uh, AAII uh, members their thoughts on each week, where the market is heading for the next six months. So they'll ask whether it's, they think it's going up, no change, or going down. So the bull bear spread is taken by when you take the percentage of bearish uh, surveys and you subtract it from those of bullish uh, surveys. So I get the spread. So the extreme levels for, for this chart will be around 30 as well as negative 20. So when you look at the orange line, which is the bull bear spread, uh, when it goes above 30, means that um, there's a lot of um, bullish sentiment in the market. And doesn't and it means that it doesn't necessarily mean that S&P will, uh, will definitely retrace uh, in the months afterwards. Just as when you see in 2014, 2016, 2017, when it hits about 30, you can see afterwards the market continues to rally for S&P 500 as well as back in 2021 as well. So it's not a very, uh, it's not a very good indicator to actually time the market tops when, even when there's actually a lot of uh, bullish sentiment. Uh, in the converse, it's actually better to time some of the uh, rebounds when there's very sentiment, such as in 2015, um, 2018, 2020, you can see whenever the, 
the the spread goes close to the negative 20 mark, can see a, some sort of rebound that takes place in S&P 500 afterwards. Even in 2022, which was last year, can see um, even though we went below the 20, negative 20 level quite a bit, up to negative 40, it marked quite good rebounds, swing lows for, for S&P 500. Uh, next slide. So last indicator we looked at was the VIX. So I think this is the most popular and the most uh, indicator that the indicator that is most familiar to all of you. So it actually, what it actually calculates is a uh, thirty day expected volatility of the U.S. market when using the index uh, call and put options for S and P five hundred. So for VIX, the extreme extreme levels will be above thirty as well as negative fifteen. Uh, below negative fifteen. Sorry, below fifteen. So. Uh, when it's above 30, it shows that it's quite a bit of fear in the market and it can be used to time such, some sort of market rebounds as shown in the chart. When in 2015, uh, 2020 as well as some, sometimes in 2021 and last year as well, you can see some good rebounds in the chart when uh, it spiked to these levels. On the converse, it's not very good to time the market tops even when there's very low VIX levels like close to 15, which we are currently seeing right now. So back in, back in the days where 2014 or 2016, VIX was hovering around that level. The market just sort of went sideways. And then in 2017 to about 2019, we saw VIX below 15, but the general trend-wise is still going up uh, overall. Yeah, so it's not very... All of these indicators are more useful to time sort of the market uh, rebounds than the market tops. Uh, next slide. Uh, so in conclusion, right, I would think that the, the least reliable of all, of all of these three indicators would likely be the AI survey results because it's more opinion-based. Basically, you're just asking the members what's their opinions and they're not really, it doesn't really affect the market in terms of fund flow as compared to your book call ratios where they're actually buying options in the market as well as VIX, which is also calculated based on options. And when I mean, talking about VIX, the, the limitation is that during periods of high volatility, the 30 level is not a definite marker to show, to actually sort of estimate a rebound. It can actually go well above it, such as when you hit above like 80 during the COVID uh, market crash before the market actually bottom. So I would think that the preferred tool to look at would probably be the CBOE uh, put call ratio, where the extreme level of above 0 0.8 has been consistent with market rebounds to, to sort of time the market rebound, uh, even do, it worked very well, even during the periods of high volatility and extreme fear, as such as in the 2020 market. Yeah. Uh, next slide. So uh, in terms of uh, individual counters, uh, I have one of them, which is Delphi. So for this, it's a technical buy at 132. The take profit levels are 144 and 165. The stop loss at 125, and the stop loss close at 133. So this is one of our top picks for the recent uh, strategy and stock picks, which is, and then uh, it actually broke out uh, on Monday last week of this uh, consol wedge consolidation, uh, coupled with a bullish crossover on MACD as well. So I think that Delphi could actually continue its midterm uh, bullish momentum carrying on from the ascending triangle breakout in May last year, uh, sorry, May this year, yeah, to, to hit this, uh, to hit this uh, take profit levels possibly. Yeah, so that's all from me now. I'll pass on my time to Paul to talk about Singapore really. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Zin. Uh, next slide. So we just run through the usual uh, macro data that was released last week. Um, uh, most of the data is actually ne uh, negative. Uh, so for Singapore, we had exports number, export numbers. It continues to decline, uh, minus 15%. Uh, electronics also remains weak, minus 16%. And the uh, second quarter, 23 electronic exports in Singapore was down about 22%. So we think this could also translate to you know, sluggish uh, electronics revenue coming up from contract manufacturers or even for someone like uh, Venture and so forth. So uh, uh, do expect weak results from uh, the electronic companies. Uh, in terms of new launch, uh, private residential launch in June, it, it was also down almost 40%. I think this is the impact of the post-cooling measure. Uh, hopefully, there will be a rebound in July as uh, we see more new launches recently and the take-up rates has been uh, healthy. Uh, Year-to-date, uh, property volumes in terms of new transactions down 20%. 
So, so this might impact uh, PropNex. Uh, there's always a bit of lag, but we think this could uh, will, will impact PropNex re results because it might affect their their uh, their top their revenue. But again, the timing is also a bit of an issue because it's always a lag effect. But we sh we should see some some weakness at least on the numbers. Uh, we don't have resale, but again, it's also depending on whether PropNex can gain market share. So so this is a bit of a, some of the unknowns. Uh, but we were just expecting some rebound, but I guess with the cooling measure, it continues to be weak. Uh, we have also RMC, which is ready mixed concrete. Uh, of course, the main companies here are Hong Long Asia and, and Penn United, which are Peggy covers. So there was a bit of an uptick in, in demand, but year to date, it's still down 1.3%. Uh, one final, uh, I guess for most, at least uh, important data point is also uh, uh, activity in Changi. So we also get like passenger numbers in June. So passengers continues to be very strong. Uh, up 75% year on year. Uh, but the cargo is weak. So as Peggy highlighted before, I think cargo volume is going to be poor because of the weak trade, trade conditions. So it's down about 17%. So what it basically means is that trade activity is down, but tourism is up. I mean, just a nutshell that's happening in Singapore. Uh, in terms of some of the Chinese data, it's also weak. I think we got retail sales. It slowed quite significantly for May because uh, May had a post reopening. But pre-pandemic, Chinese retail sales is about 7%. So this is also still trending below pre-pandemic levels. Uh, fixed asset investments is probably the weakest spot. I, I, I didn't share the data, but it's mainly the private sector investments has been weak. Uh, the government sector continues to invest, but not the private sector. Uh, uh, the one weak point is property sales. So June, it totally collapsed on property sales in, in China. What we measure is the square feet sold. So it's down about almost 30%. Uh, year to date is only down 11 so it means that the weakness is uh, turning sharper especially in June so we think uh, there was maybe mid, uh, April May the property numbers was a bit better oh, sorry uh, March, and a March and April May there was a bit of uh, pent up demand but now you can see that uh, it continues to deteriorate very sharply and, and there are implications uh, which we'll discuss later uh, US also the data also still weak so uh, we think what we monitor is uh, US retail sales excluding motor vehicles because motor vehicles is very volatile. Uh, it, it swings 20% up, 20% down. So normally uh, uh, investors or you can take that mo and motor vehicle out so we can get the underlying trend growth for retail sales. So that's also continues to weaken. It's about the weakest pace in three years. Uh, loans growth is also weakening in the US. Uh, slowest in a decade. Uh, next, next slide. So... So after all the cherry news, uh, uh, so this is just our own, our, our usual tactical views or commentary on the market is that you know, we continue to see more signs of a slowdown. Uh, consumer spending is weakening both US and also China. Uh, so basically it's going to weigh on global growth. Uh, the property, you know, in usually when uh, China relaxes property measures, there's usually a pop in property sector and, and this helps, but, but right now, uh, the property sector demand is collapsing in China. And this only not only hurts the developers, it's going to hurt the whole supply chain. So upstream, you have the building material, steel, uh, uh, no, sorry, steel, cement, whatsoever, will be affected. And also downstream, also you're affected, you, know, you have furniture, household goods. So when the property sector is weak, it, it, it has a huge repercussion, not only just on one segment, it affects multiple sectors. So... Uh, that will weigh down on 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 China too. Uh, so the next point here is that uh, so on the twenty six, if you look at the bottom twenty six, there will be a Fed rate decision. So there's a ninety percent probability the market is is factor, or is uh, factoring a ninety percent probability there will be a twenty five basis point cut. Uh, then the issue is whether there will be a pause. So when we look at the past three cycles where uh, the Federal Reserve you no know, raise rates, then they start to pause. You know what? is the equity market behavior. So we'll show you a chart later, but after a series of interest rate hikes, usually when there's a pause, that there can be, on average, there can be a short equity rally. Uh, but the funny thing is that then when the Fed starts to cut rates, actually the market will actually weaken very sharply. So, so in conclusion, what it means is that it really depends on the uh, economic condition. So normally when the Fed pause, then if the economy will, will weaken very sharply, uh, because you 2000, 2007 with the recession years and even 2019 with the COVID later on, then uh, because the economy is weak, the rate cuts doesn't mean the market will rally. Actually, rate cuts will be followed by more weakness in the equity markets. 
Uh, but the one thing that does happen all three times is that the bond uh, will rally. So that means interest rates will continue to come down because the Fed is cutting too. And th that, that is why we, we have, although we don't see much growth in REITs, but we are just overweight on REITs just to position ourselves for, for this slowdown coming and, and for this whole uh, sequencing of economic conditions to happen. But any, sorry if it's a bit complica uh, complicated. But So in terms of the e events that's coming up, uh, we will we have um uh Microsoft Google all the Fang reporting results twenty fifth then twenty sixth of course the big one of the Fed interest rates uh everybody was just watching whether Powell will make any comments whether is this the last rate high and all that but he probably won't he just say that data dependent and the usual the usual mantra uh then of course on the twenty seven we got the big uh you got UOB results in the morning then Capital's results in the evening then got SIA results. Uh, these are some of the events we're having. So this week, we will have a uh, Savannah read too. So uh, feel free to, to dial in, especially if you're a shareholder looking to vote in the EGM. And of course, we are, the rest is all upcoming. may not be in the Poland's website yet. Yeah. Uh, next slide. Uh, so, so this is just that uh, for us, as the title suggests, now we see China momentum slowing down. Uh, the, the the chart on the left is very noisy. It's up and down, up and down. But uh, the latest June sales is 3%. So it's far be. If you look at the pre-pandemic, maybe 2017 before, you can see that uh, China retail sales usually trend about 7%. Of course, it used to be very strong in the past, almost 20% plus. Uh, then property demand is also weakening. Yeah. Just that uh, because of the volatility, it's hard to see a proper trend, but uh, the latest number is still very weak. Uh, next slide. Right. Uh, then uh, we also continue to see more signs of a softer US economy. You know, retail sales is down, loans growth is down. So I think th this chart is a bit easier to, to see the underlying trend. Next slide. Uh, okay, these are very complicated, uh, but so so just bear with it. Uh, the, the 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 table on the right is just all the data that we we, we were compute compiling because we are just trying to understand what is the what is a possible playbook. It doesn't mean it will repeat. So we're just trying to understand when the Fed pause, uh, how would the market perform? I think that's the underlying thing. So you, you can see the red line is basically when the Fed raised rates. So after the Fed raised rates, then they were pause. You can see number one. The problem is normally after when they pause, we enter to a recession. So uh, then they will have to, then when they pause, the equity market, which is in blue, tends to weaken uh, when they start cutting. But the problem is also this has to coincide with the recession. So, so it's also whether how sharp the US economy slows. Of course, global financial crisis was the same thing. Uh, they paused. Uh, if you look on the table on the right, in, in June, July 06 to August 07, there was a pause. Uh, the market actually did rally uh, when they paused. But then after that, uh, when the economy really weakened, entered recession, then when the Fed started to cut rate, actually the market collapsed even more. So that's the number three is the happened in 2019 when the Fed paused. The market actually did rally. So pausing seems to push the equity markets. But then uh, the problem is that the equity market will... But then economic growth will weaken because they, they always lag out, right? The, the Fed, when they, the market is really weakening, then they start to pause. Then when they start cutting rates, that's where the market kind of weakens. But again, uh, it's a bit more difficult in, in number three or 2020 because it's pandemic and no one can actually forecast that. So, but again, this is just a rough playbook for just to get us ready when the Fed uh, pauses. Uh. Yeah, it doesn't mean you will repeat them. Yeah, uh, next slide. Okay, so this is my last slide. Uh, we had uh, Thompson Medical. Thompson Medical well, probably never met them for almost three years because there was a change in management. But Thompson Medical had the analyst briefing. Uh, I think the main shareholders, I think if most of you may not know, but it's uh, Peter Lim. Uh, so Thompson Medical, this briefing was mainly because of their uh, acquisition in Vietnam. But just to give you a bit of background, so in terms of market care, 1.6 billion, they have uh, one hospital in Singapore, of course, the well-known Thompson Medical Center. They also have one hospital in Malaysia uh, under the listed company called TMC Life Science, which they have 70% stake. Uh, they also have one big, huge piece of land in uh, Johor City uh, where they plan to build maybe a 500-bit hospital, but it's, they haven't started anything because they want to wait for the infrastructure. But... Uh, so recently, they made an acquisition in, in Vietnam uh, for 500 million, so 33 times PE. Uh, the, uh, I think the, in Iskandar, they, they, their game plan to build a big hospital in Iskandar is mainly because this to them is the closest private hospital to Singapore. Uh, 
a huge one. I mean, of course, there are private hospitals in Singapore, but there hasn't been any major private hospitals in, in Singapore. So to them, if the RTS or the real connection between Johor and Singapore is up, then this could give them a signal that the infrastructure is ready for them to build one new hospital. Uh, here they just added, then Singapore, they have 187 uh, beds. Uh, so in the in terms of the outlook, uh, the earnings actually tripled in 2022. Uh, I think this is somewhat similar to what happened to Raffles Medical. So what happened was th this thing called the Transitional Care Facility, the TCF. So uh, Transitional Care Facility is uh, it's a step-down care from the acute hospital. So it's mainly from, from those patients that uh, maybe they, they don't need to, to have such a intense treatment in the normal public acute hospital, then they will move to this transitional care facility, uh, which Thompson has in Sengkang. is about, I think, 164 bed. Um, better in Sengkang. And so what happens is that uh, during this period, uh, before the homes are ready to take in the patients, uh, these patients will be there. So they don't take up the beds in the our usual acute hospitals owned by the government. And that, now there's a bit of a bed crunch uh, in the public sector hospitals. So this helped help them a lot because this is like a new 164-bed hospital, you no know, no startup costs, and it's on contract. So this uh and but the problem for this type of business is a six months renewal. This is not meant to be a long-term business. So this is uh, still contractual, they are paid a service fee. Uh, this just that we worry that there'll be under margin pressure because uh, with the pandemic over, then we think the authorities might might uh, negotiate lower in terms of the pricing. Uh, so, so we we think twenty twenty two will be impacted by twenty twenty three. Sorry, will be impacted by margin pressure on the TCF, and also when they acquire this Viet, uh, Vietnam hospital, uh, it's actually going to be dilutive to the earnings plus interest expense they have to pay. Uh, they actually mentioned a nine million earnings dilution. So near term, there's going to be a little a lot of dilution uh, for them. The only growth driver is that. Uh, their KL hospital just added another 300 bits, but it take time to ramp. But we think earnings might be a bit sluggish. I mean, by our own view, we don't have coverage, but just uh, looking at some of these moving parts. Uh, so with that, I think uh, we'll hand on to, uh, we can move on to Q&A. Thanks, Paul. Uh, I'll start the Q&A. Um, there's a question here, what's your TP for Tesla? Uh, so just not like I mentioned, we don't cover Tesla, so it's non-rated. We don't have a target price. But if you look at uh, some of the consensus analyst target prices right now, it's somewhere in the range of 200 to 220. So it's a little bit below uh, where the stock price is right now. Uh, if that helps. Um, there's another question here. Hi, could you uh, shed some light on the rebalancing that seems to be happening on the NASDAQ this week? Yeah, so actually the rebalancing is going to happen tonight, um, the 24th. Essentially, what happened was that um, there was a rally in Tesla stock, uh, which brought the uh, the weightage of companies that were over four point five percent in the Nasdaq over forty eight percent, over forty something percent. Uh, and so, what this actually happened was that the Nasdaq came out and said they were going to do a one time span, a special rebalancing. Uh, essentially, the the terms weren't really clear, but essentially, what they're going to be doing is reducing. Uh, these companies, which are maybe your five big, five or six companies. Um, so I believe it's Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, uh, Tesla, and Nvidia. Uh, if I'm not wrong. Uh, they're going to be reducing their weightage in the NASDAQ 100 uh, to below 40%. So you've got about an 8% drop in terms of uh, combined weightage for for uh, these companies. So, so uh, and, and they're going to be redistributing this to companies that are not so heavily weighted. So essentially what you could see is a little bit more volati volatility uh, in index, especially, you know, this is going to be a big earnings week for this week and next week. Um, uh, at the same time, obviously the, the, the companies that are being rebalanced down, uh, you'll see, you know, funds flow out because a lot of the, the funds that track the index will, will follow suit. Um, so there'll be, it should be a little bit more uh, negative, you know, price pressures over there. Um, whereas on the flip side, those that actually gain weightage, um, probably like your smaller in, uh, smaller cap names, or, or, or uh, they should see some sort of inflows because as, as money managers uh, rebalance their own portfolios. I mean, you know, this, I mean the, the NASDAQ is one of the most heavily traded indexes, or at least the triple Q is one of the most heavily uh, traded indexes uh, in the world. 
Uh, and so if everything rebalances, then you should just kind of see uh, uh, some sort of price movement. Uh, yeah, but, but overall, to I guess to the passive investor, it doesn't really make that much difference. Um, by virtue of the rebalancing, their portfolio will be less, um, uh, will be more diversified. It will be less concentrated on, on the few stocks that are getting rebalanced down. Uh, yeah, but and and so technically this should uh, hurt the performance of the Nasdaq slightly. Yeah, but but not, it it shouldn't be that uh, significant. Um, and also because it's predominantly focused on tech uh, companies. Yeah, I hope, hope that helps. Sorry, it's a bit longer. Uh, it's also, I guess, a bit difficult to explain. Um, there's another question here on any comments on the performance of cruise lines in the US, like Carnival and. RCL and do they still have upside or is it priced in already? Yeah, so we don't cover these kind of stocks. Um, um, but if you look at the, the target prices for some of these companies as well, they are actually below current prices. Um, so you know, t take it with a pinch of salt. Uh, analyst target price and where it is right now. Uh, if you're looking to compare, uh, you know, just like financials, I took a quick look at it. Um, right now they're still loss making. They've been loss making, I guess, since the pandemic. Um, and so you know, there's this hype. There's so much hype about uh, travelers are coming back. Uh, things are, are getting better, but at the end of the day, bottom line is still negative. Some of the main reasons I think is because it's a little bit more expensive. Uh, you know, wages have increased quite significantly, so they're spending a little bit more on uh, commissions on wages and stuff like that to actually keep uh, cruise these cruise liners operating. So so your your operating costs have have gone up. Revenue isn't really back to pre-pandemic yet. Um, so I think maybe overall probably a little bit premature to, to kind of jump on the band I get there. Uh, yeah, if you're looking at these kind of cruise liners or other entertainment uh, stocks, you know, you've got other stocks like uh, Las Vegas Sands and, and so on to kind of uh, compare with as well. Uh, yeah, hope that helps. Uh, unfortunately, we, don't, we don't, can't really say too much because we don't really cover it, uh, this sector of stocks. Uh, I think that's all for right now. Oh, oh, sorry, there's a question that came in. How do you compare Tesla, BYD, and x -Pin? Uh Okay, I'll take this one and then that will be my last question. Uh, so essentially, um, uh, so essentially, it is the only, it is difficult to, to compare Tesla and BYD because BYD is predominant in China. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, BYD is not actually an exclusive uh, EV company. They also do your uh, plug-in hybrids. So when it comes to, to I guess market share is a little bit difficult to compare both. Um, uh, whereas, you know, Tesla obviously is just straight EVs. There's no hybrid. There's no uh, uh, internal combustion engine at all. Um, but when you compare, uh, I guess, Tesla versus other, uh, other traditional car manufacturers uh, outside of China, uh, they're by far the best in terms of operating margin. They're the best in terms of performance, uh, they're the best in terms of growth. Um, so so yeah, but within within China, I think uh, predominantly you only be looking at BYD. A lot of the other ones are expanding and new, um, and relatively newer in the market. So relatively smaller in terms of scale, uh, younger in terms of their production line, uh, and 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 so so. I think obviously when you compare both. The winner outside of China most likely will be Tesla. Uh, the winner within China, BYD, is, is far and above uh, everyone else in China. Uh, yeah, ho hope this helps uh, uh, a little bit. Uh, yeah, uh, so with that, I'll, I'll hand it back to the rest of my colleagues to answer the rest of the questions. Thank you. Hey, thanks, John. I think I'll take this qu one question on the banks first. Um... Sorry, let me find it. Okay, well, what is the earning outlook of the three local banks? Results due next week, at least a high level expectation. Yeah, so I will be able to provide more of uh, just a brief overview of what we expect for the banks. For the earnings wise, it's quite similar uh, over across all three banks. The three banks are expected to, you know, sort of post uh, rather high earnings and maybe even a possibility of record earnings. And this is coming from uh, two main things. Firstly, the net interest income. So while they have mentioned that, and we are also expecting that their name will sort of stagnate, so the growth will not be as, as fast as it was over the last few quarters. 
the it will still be a significant improvement, at least in the basis points term year on year. And you know, but for quarter on quarter wise, we might see that it will be either flat or it might even decline. And you know, the year on year increase will, will boost their net interest income. So this is their main contributor to their revenue. However, the second point that, that will that will really give the earnings, uh, the earnings growth driver is their fee income. So fee income was very uh, low in 2022. And we're going to 2023. In the first quarter, we saw that there was a huge jump and a recovery in this uh, fee income. So fee income is expected to continue to improve, at least on a year-on-year -year basis. Even on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis, I would say that it will start to improve. And this is mainly coming from things like their wealth management and their uh, credit card segments. And this is across the board for all three banks. Uh, however, I would say that there would be a, there might be a slight increase in their provisioning as, as, as you know, they're setting aside more provisions for uh, sort of a risk you know, with the high interest rate environment. And they, they might need to set aside more provisions just in case there, is, there are more defaults in their loans. But they, they did mention that they don't expect that their NPL ratio will increase significantly going into the rest of the year. And I think the last point I'd like to bring up is their loans growth. So loans growth has been very flat. Even the, the data that we see that is covering all the loans in Singapore is it has been in a sort of a decline over the last few months. And the first quarter results showed that as well. I think the, the average was like a 0 to 1% year-on-year -year growth or loans growth. But if we go into the second quarter, at least the last month, we saw that there was a bit of an improvement in the loans. And this is coming from the sort of a smaller decline in the in the other uh, broad-based segments while they are, the housing loans are actually still the only ones that are showing some growth. Yeah, so we, we whole loans growth will, I think will continue to still be pretty flat. You know, they won't, it won't grow as much, but we might see some improvement. The guidance for loans growth is, is still kept at low to mid single, I think it's low, low single digit now, yeah. So I hope that answers your question, thanks. I'll hand it over to the rest of my colleagues. Yeah, thanks. Let me do the one on U96, that is SEMCOP Industries. Okay, there are a few questions for SEMCOP. Uh, what is your view for U96? And then, yeah, I think there are at least two questions on SEMCOP. Okay, SEMCOP Industries, the price running, uh, also because of the expectation that they will be included in the MSCI Singapore Index, in the next review that's to, to be announced in August this August 10, I think. Yeah. So, uh, and together with this the possibility that venture might be taken out from the index. Um, another positive for SAMCOP industry is that uh, you recall in April, May, there was a spike in energy demand. Uh, so, they, they, especially in the UK, where they, in the UK, they work as a the capacity is more as an uh, energy storage. So, so they are always working like a standby capacity. So when, when the demand rises, when in the energy demand rises in the UK, then they, their capacity will be called into, into service. So there, there could be an income, uh, a, a additional gains, additional income from the UK uh, uh, capacity. But, but if you, re, but then, if you recall last year in the first half of last uh, 22, the SEMCOP had a uh, book uh, and a hedging gain of about 94 million because uh, after the, the the Russian Ukraine war erupted, the price spike and then they could we were able to to enjoy the the sharp increase in the energy cost. So this gain 94 million is not likely to recur again this year. So that so that is a negative offsetting the, the profit for this year, the profit growth for this year. So all in, uh, we think it, we, it, SEMCOP might still post a, a small gain, probably a single digit uh, profit growth for first half 23, uh, taking into account all these factors. Uh, we, we're still keeping our $5.02 and, and target price, but uh, there's, there's room for revision upwards if they, if the, the is, is, Sam Cox, uh, 
STEM core strategy is of continuing building up their renewable energy capacity, but a lot of these are in either green field or brown field. So if, if uh, in the next results, they announce more of this being converted into become operational, then there's room for me to adjust the cash flow projections for, for STEM core, then in, in turn, the drive up the DCF valuation and the target price. So at the moment, is, uh, we're still keeping it. Uh, the results are coming out in the early, early August. Thank you. Uh, move on. I'll take the next question. Um, there's this question on what is your view for AMD? So <clears throat> for AMD, we have recently just initiated our report on it. So basically, we are still expecting um, challenging second quarter because the PC stuff, the PC market is still continuing. But on the bright side is that uh, the company has said that uh, the bottom has already passed. So uh, they're still maintaining the view that they are going to recover in the second half of this year. And then, the sec and then the second point is that we, we also feel that there's a chance of margin expansion as well, mainly because it sells more of its data center and embedded uh, products, uh, which are higher margins compared to those which uh, compared to its uh, consumer products, such as your PC CPUs, as well as your uh, gaming graphics card. So um, this is particularly important because for the, the MD had just released their data center CPU last at uh, December last year. So this year, they are still expecting to be sale of a mix between both old and the new generation of the CPU. But uh, moving forward, they are, they, are, they are going to expect that uh, the sale will predominantly be dominated by the new CPU, which is about 50% uh, more expensive than the previous one. So yeah, there's a potential for margin expansion there. And then in terms of the generative AI uh, boom, um, obviously NVIDIA will be the main benefactor for uh, main benefactor for, for in the GPU market, but we still think AMD has to play in that part as well, mainly because firstly, server still needs CPUs, although they may not need as many uh, as many compared to the number they need on GPUs. But yeah, AMD is the is going to benefit from this uh, trend as well. And then furthermore, one important thing we would like to note is that we think AMD is able to should be able to gain market share in the future in the GPU market as well, uh, mainly because we, we think customers are more than likely to look for a second source supplier so that they don't really need to rely as much on NVIDIA, given the fact that NVIDIA, <laughs> NVIDIA uh, is reportedly having a long lead time right now. So uh, especially uh, the market is also, also wants to reduce the reliance on NVIDIA so that they don't have a monopoly, uh, monopoly, monopolistic market and they don't have such a strong pricing power. So yeah, I hope that answers your question. Thanks. So let me jump in here again. There are a couple of questions for EV. I just like to round it up. Uh, there's a question here. Would you be reporting on EV in the future? And then another one would be, can I report, can I cover Tesla as the biggest one? Uh, yeah, so unfortunately, uh, we're not actually able to tell you or mention you know, what our future coverage will look like. Uh, but we definitely, uh, at least company specific, uh, but we'll definitely keep following uh, Tesla, you know, doing the Philip on the ground as well as uh, covering some uh, of the EV stuff in our quarterly uh, outlook and, and strategy. Uh, yeah, that's all I can say for that. I, I, unfortunately, I can't really comment too much on the future. Thank you. Thank you, Ivy. Uh, Ivy, thank you Thanks, John. Uh, I have a follow-up question here. Um, can NVIDIA produce CPU later to compete with AMD? After all, it has success with GPU. Yeah, so uh, a uh, Nvidia has already announced that it is going to produce a CPU, uh, but it is kind of different from the CPU uh, that is produced by Intel and AMD. So the difference mainly is the technology that it uses. So uh, Nvidia's uh, CPU is using ARM architecture, whereas AMD and Intel they use the long, the one that has already been uh been used for over the last few decades that that we see in our PCs now, which is the x86. So yeah, to answer your question in short, yes, NVIDIA is producing their CPU and they will be sampling, I believe, in the third quarter or the, or the fourth quarter of this year to the customers. So yeah, this is going to be a threat for AMD as well. But again, I guess it will take some time to see, it will, it will have to see how the adoption rate is. 
And because ultimately, um, customers are already accustomed to using x86 CPU. So we, we're not sure how it's going to affect their workflow if they switch to NVIDIA's uh, CPUs as well. And then likewise, uh, the other way is, uh, so it's also the same thing whereby uh, some customers are already comfortable in using NVIDIA GPUs, but maybe if let's say there's a supply shortage in the future, maybe AMD can come in to provide a second source of supply. Hope that answers your question. Thanks. Maybe I jump back in again. I saw, saw some questions for me. There's one question that says, if you had a couple of hours to spare, would you attend the coming AGM of SIA or Singtel? Yeah, we always try to attend uh, through, we try to apply to, for, for Philip to appoint us as a proxy and, and go for this. So uh, I'm still waiting, hopefully, for, for the opportunity to attend SIA's meeting this, this uh, I think this Thursday, I haven't got a, a, a confirmation yet. But we always try to do that yeah, as much as we can. Uh, but because we don't own a share, so we have to ask for help to appoint us as proxy. The other question here is, uh, do you cover Fortress? You used to cover this stock. Are we still covering? Uh, we don't cover it right now. Uh, uh, also because the, the, the trading volume is very low, it doesn't, doesn't much justify our our uh, the time we we need to spend on on uh, fortress as a sector because when we cover fortress it's not just covering fortress we probably have to also look into BHP and the the other iron ore miners and look into steel output look into China construction demand and so on so it's it's an entire new sector on its own so yeah but if you think if there's interest you you would like to have coverage maybe you can try pushing for it thanks thank you uh, i hand back to the rest thank you Darren, uh, meow. yes okay i right, so there's a question on how the menu life i mean there are many questions on how the, the menu life read evaluation will affect prime yeah so first of all i'll begin by saying that um Prime, they are not going to do a mid-year valuation mainly because um, they did, they are, the bankers didn't request for it and also the valuers didn't see the need to uh, kind of uh, do the valuation because uh, they did not see that the portfolio valuation declined. They do not see it declining more than 5% from the December 22 numbers. So I did some uh, rough calculations for Prime scaring to hit Five uh, fifty percent right now. The gearing is at forty three percent. So for prime scaling to hit fifty percent, the assets have to uh, decline in value by about seventeen percent. So the the issue um for prime is that since they're not doing a mid year valuation, we will not know exactly how much valuations move. We will only know at the end year. So as of this juncture, like the first half results, uh, I don't see primes uh, dividends or uh or such getting affected by, by these evaluations. Yeah, so so that is just a, a broad overview for us to answer some of the questions. How, okay. Um, yeah, so price gearing is at 43.7% and it's, it's still, uh, there's still some headroom there. Uh, yeah, the next one is, hi, do you, Think that mass may be forced to do this in the near future. Yeah, so for menu life right now, uh, the ball is in the banker's court or the lender's court. So if they they do seek the uh, give menu life the waiver, and then uh yeah, menu life uh will pro will have to do some uh uh probably they will have either to raise um, raise funds or to divest more assets to bring down the gearing. But then, uh, forced to delete, uh, probably not. I, I would say it's unlikely unless uh, they the bankers call a default on their loans. Yeah, but I, in my view, I think that is unlikely for now. Cause right now it's just a bank review for the for the sixty percent. Is it's not a, a default yet. Yeah, so so I think uh, it's still unlikely that they'll be forced to default or uh, be suspended. 
Uh, what do you think of Gokulan fundamentally and technically? Yeah, I'll leave the technical part to Zain. Uh, but for Gokulan, um, they are definitely hit by the higher ABSD that for foreigners, the, the one that for, jumped from 30% to 60% in April. But for Gokulan, uh, we do not cover them, but at least we think that they are they are doing good in their investment business. Like they have this uh, new Goko Midtown and their Goko Tower, as well as uh, they have a 3D color query, which is 95% uh, occupied. So all these are, are doing quite, quite good in a weaker property development kind of uh, market. Yeah, at least they have their investment business to, to help support them. Yeah, yeah. So we do not cover Goko Land. Uh, yeah, HPL, which companies are HPL's peers in the market? Is it comparable to Google Land? Yeah, uh, they are in the same uh, industry. So yeah, they Google Land kind of is HPL's peers at their hospitality, commercial as well, and development. Yeah. Um, looks like Manulife Week will not be paying out any dividends this year, right? Uh, yeah, so this all depends on whether they can get the waiver for the first half. And um, if they are unable to pay this year, uh, like for first half, uh, they might be able to push it to the end year. But that is, oh uh, yeah, it's it's still hard to call for now. But but the main issue is that they need to seek the waiver from from the banks for for the first half, like within the next a uh, couple of weeks. Yeah, but. So, so like I mentioned, if they don't get the waiver from the banks, it's really unlikely that they'll be able to pay out any dividends for the first half of 23. But yeah, then the next question will be we pay out any dividends like for Prime. Yeah, so uh, yeah, like I mentioned before, for Prime US, uh, personally, I don't, okay, because of the location of the assets, like many life, the assets are a lot of, if it is in gateway cities and prime, uh, not so much, maybe one or two only. So, because of the location, uh, I, I do not see per se that the valuation decline will be to that extent for, for prime. But I do, but we understand that uh, higher vacancies as well will, will kind of impact the valuations. But we note that. Um, Prime, they have uh, the leverage to attract tenants that they can invest, like tenant, capex, etc. Well, maybe like they are having some um, difficulties in the liquidity, rather in, the, in their liquidity. So it's kind of challenging for them to kind of uh, attract tenants as well, because these days you need to give uh, tenant incentives and such. And that's why you need the liquidity there. But, but that is also uh, one of the problems, one of the reasons why uh, many lives they are their vacancy rose so much because they are unable to kind of attract the, the tenants. Yeah, so to answer this question specifically, uh, will Prime face the same problem as many life and will they paying dividends? He said, yeah, I, uh, I see Prime paying uh, dividends, especially for the first half, 23. Uh, when will United Hampshire be paying out dividends this year, if any? Uh, United Hampshire, they'll be paying out after they release their results uh, this quarter. So um, the payment will probably be around uh, August, early August, uh, yeah, um, X date maybe in early August, and then they'll pay out uh, shortly after. Uh, any upside for Capital DC and when are they paying out dividends this year, if any? <clears throat> yeah, so uh, for Capital DC, they also will be paying out dividends after the first half, it should be about <clears throat> Uh, soon, it will, their capital DC read, they will be announcing their results uh, later today. So uh, after they release their results and they will announce the dividends and the uh, dividends will probably go <coughs> uh, exit within the next few days and they'll pay out uh, subsequently after that. So uh, early August, like, like I would assume, yeah, let's talk about DC. And for the fundamental part, any upside of capital DC read, <coughs> Um, Capital Street, their, their leases are quite long and some of these, 50% of it is based on CPI and some are just fixed escalation clauses. So for Capital DC, um, I don't, um, we, we haven't uh, accumulate call on Capital DC, but we note that the higher interest rates, all these will affect the Capital DC and 
uh, like Paul mentioned also earlier in this presentation that we do not see much upside for REITs, but we are in it because of the dividend play. Yeah, because of the high interest expense, you eat into the DPU, right? So yeah, that's why we um, yeah, do not see much upside for REITs and capital DC is included. Mm. Yeah, I think that's so for me for now. I can see. Uh, I think I'll head over to ML to, for for now. Thanks. I thank you, Darren. Oh, I see a question for Sabana. Oh, do you see any advantages for Sabana holders to vote in favor of the two resolutions? Uh. If both the vote in favor, the current management team will be removed and the rate will adopt an internalized management structure, which will potentially save some cost. Like the original management fee is used to pay the external manager. Now the unit holder will have a cut of that. Um, but um the amount of but the amount the unit holder is saving as marginal comparing with the disruption caused by the removal. Uh, it will cost some downtime as the current employee may choose to live during the transition period. And there will be extra cost for the rate, such as uh, setting up the subsidiary. And yeah, as mentioned previously, they'll pay back all the loans. Uh, yeah, they will have a webinar with Sabana on 28th July at 12 p.m. So it's a Friday lunchtime. Yeah, we strongly encourage all the unit holders to attend and um, have a full picture of what's going on and also make a rational decision. Yeah, I'll hand over to the rest of my colleague. Thank you. Yeah, continue. Uh, there's another question. Do you see any impact on REITs with China resuming visa free travel for Singaporeans? Yeah, so uh, this will, will definitely help um, the hospitality sector, especially those with uh, assets in China, like uh, as Capital and Escort. Yeah, so we, we do have a buy call on Capital and Escort for now. Um, what is your forecast of Singapore REITs as another interest rate rise is coming? Yeah, so we know that uh, even though another uh, rise of uh, interest rate rise is probably incoming in a few days' time, but uh, as a strategy, we are in, into REITs. I'll, I'll let Paul explain further later. I think there's a, there's a question on that as well. Um, so our forecast of Singapore REITs is that we are we are flat, but we are in it for the dividend play as we, we think that the REITs will give still dividends and it will like that they use spread right over the 10 year uh, government bond as I think there, there are some charts that Paul mentioned earlier as well that the the bond price uh, might start to increase in the in the when the Fed start to cut rates. So that will all bring the use spread even further for the Singapore REITs. Which, which is uh, basically the, how much you're compensated over the risk-free rate. So a higher use spread means you're compensated more and it's, yeah, it's more worth it, kind of, yeah, compensated more for the risk of investing in REITs. So it's more worth it for you to invest in REITs. Uh, yeah, that's one. I'm in Bulgaria now. The economy is doing badly. Um, not many people are going to work. Is is CV rising rates again? And how would this? Yeah. So Cromer and Eric, uh, we do not cover, and uh, they are all affected as well by the high interest rate. But Cromer recently, they I think just today they announced that their property devaluation is not as bad as expected. Uh, their property kind of just a slight decline of one point six percent. The logistics and light industrial sector is doing well. It actually increased by 0.8%. But the office sector, yeah, we do know that the is, is weak and for Cromwell specifically, the valuation uh, declined. Yeah. Um, yeah, so how how will it affect them? Yeah, it's it's the same thing. The high interest rates will, will affect their their bottom line. So <clears throat> Yeah, we do not have a call on Cromwell and Ivory. <coughs> so yeah. <coughs> yeah, so I can't really say what was our call for that. Yeah. 
it, yeah, I think that's all. I think I hand over to Paul. Let me, oh, let me jump back in. Let, let me jump in to answer just two questions. Okay, there's a question on any insights from the SETS AGM and views going forward. Uh, fortunately, I could not attend the SETS AGM. It clashed with an, other meetings. Uh, we still uh, maintain our view that uh, cargo, the exposure to cargo, which will be which will be raised after the acquisition of WFS, will actually increase the risk premium for SETS. Uh, given that the cargo market outlook is not, not bullish and is, is uh, actually the, the volume is on the way down and given the big outlook for manufacturing sector, cargo will face further pressure going down in the second half of this year. So uh, we still maintain a neutral view with a target price of $2.51. Um, yeah, I, I hope I have answered that question. The, the second question is, um, I think, uh, hi again, please allow us to clarify why you prefer to attend SIA's AGM versus Singtel's AGM. For example, what do you hope to learn from attending such AGM in person? Okay, I, 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 I talk, sorry, I might have uh, miss, I might have uh, confused you. I spoke a lot about SIA AGM because I cover SIA. As Paul covers Singtel, so he, he will also go for Singtel. So we try, in, um, in the team, we try as much as possible to attend any meetings that we can reach out to the management. Um, because at this session, especially for the big, big tech companies, uh, the, this is a rare opportunity to be able to meet the entire board and, the, and some of the top management for different divisions. So we can go further uh, and learn from them on what, what's happening on the ground for them in, in their respective field. The other thing also at this AGM, we can also learn from other investors. When you look when from the questions, you can tell what are the concerns. So, so it's a really uh, a very rare learning opportunities for, for any type of meetings. So, so we, we will, will uh, try to, to be at any, any meetings that is possible for us to, to gain some uh, ground knowledge and, and learn so that we can then bring it back and, and share with the rest of you. Yeah, so I hope I've answered that question. I'll pass it. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Maggie. Yeah. Uh, any as a rule of thumb, if 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 there's a billionaire attend the AGM, we'll try, we we'll try to go. <laughs> yeah, sorry, this is a partly a joke, but anyway. Uh okay, so let me just try to answer a few. I think that we got like 60 questions. I don't think we can take on everything because we also have the technicals. I'll answer a few, then I hand it over to Zane. Uh so the question, what about comfort they'll grow? Uh, then there's also another question that uh, Comfort Delgo has been bidding for projects everywhere. This seems to be small in scale, also short in contract. The Paris project uh, in six years. What's the competitive edge? Uh, okay, so uh, they recently won a contract in Paris. They also won a real contract in New, New Zealand. Uh, all this uh, won't really have a huge contribution, although they didn't really uh, give the amount invested. But it's mainly also to build a track record. Uh, because they are, they are going to do this global push to, to operate uh, rail and so forth. So every bit of this can help track record so that when they bid for other projects globally, you know, uh, the, the authorities can see that you know, you have a, you're, you're operating in Singapore, you're operating in Paris and so forth. So uh, they didn't say the stick they have, but I think it's going to be quite small because uh, they, their role in Paris is more on the operating, the, I think it's like HR, the systems and so forth. So they do have a role in the consortium. So in the consortium in Paris, every party has some specialty. So they also, I think, uh, the track record in running rails uh, in other countries. Uh, so so that is, they, they do have a value add, I mean, yeah. And, uh, competitive, and this competitive advantage can grow if they build, if they were to operate more and more uh, real systems globally. So, so you can imagine if they operate like five, six countries, then when they bid for another country, it will be better. And uh, all these contracts, usually there's no capital involved. It's more a service, uh, a service that the authorities will pay you for managing and running. Uh, because they will not go into these contracts where you have to buy all the trains, the rolling stock, the trains, all that, so they won't do that. Uh, what about comfort? They'll go, okay, I'm not sure this is uh, FA, but I, I guess the, the question will be the recent grab acquisition of Transcap. I'm also scratching, scratching my head. Is it positive or negative, frankly? But because there was no price given, uh, my only conclusion is that, uh, my only uh, view is that 
uh, it may be because there are just not enough drivers out there. Uh, because this is the similar thing why Gojek want to work with uh, with Comfort. I mean, why work with the enemy, right? Inverted crowd comma. So there must be something that they want from Comfort. Uh, and I think it's... It, uh, I don't think cars, because the model is... don't. Really, but I think it's mainly the drivers. Uh, I, I think they can get access to taxi drivers and taxi drivers tend to work even the night shifts and, and uh, that was what was mentioned too. The attraction of it is that, you know, uh, when you're doing a, um, the, those a P2P, those the private hire vehicles, most only want to work in the peak hours and then like probably half the fleet will disappear. But with taxi drivers, you can get a, 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 a better a servicing throughout the whole 24 hours because taxi drivers tend to also work through night shifts and so forth. I mean, that's my own view. Uh, that was what was mentioned earlier, but I'm not sure about this transaction. Uh, the, uh, the other reason why Grab want to buy is, is in their announcement they mentioned that it's going to be a, a pos it was going to be a creative so it will add to their profits which, and you know, you know Grab is trying to be as profitable as possible I guess so this could be another reason but they didn't give the amount the valuations and so so we're not sure uh, I will answer two three more then we will hand it to Zane uh, please can uh, uh, elaborate fat pause with bonds with as a strategy positioning okay so uh, what we were trying to to mention is that the last three times when the Fed Federal Reserve paused after raising interest rates, you, you see bond prices dropping. So bonds were rarely again, it's also contingent on when they pause the they raise so much until you cause the economy to, to weaken sharply. So that's one condition. The second thing is why we then when the bond prices are, are softer, then uh, it could help re-rate re REITs uh, because then the interest rate pressure on them will be less. And REITs are a bit more defensive um, because if there's a slowdown, then no REITs are... They're collecting rent. Uh, so uh, I think when if the economy slows down, it's not like the office will go vacant immediately. So they are less sensitive to an uh, economic cycle. So, so that's what we mean by uh, REITs positioning and strategy. Yeah. Just that we, like what Darren mentioned, we just that don't expect like strong DPU growth, you know, like you know, 2017, 2019 when there was... When the interest rate keep on dropping, then of course they can uh, keep on growing and they acquire more that virtuous cycle. So don't expect that. Uh, just that uh, in this cycle, this time around, the the interest rate cut or pause or cut will actually benefit them because there'll be less pressure on interest rates. Uh, when the Fed stops or pauses interest rates, will inflation continue to trend downwards, or will it be increased a few months? In other words, how immediate is the interest rate uh, movement affecting inflation? Okay, this one is even the Federal Reserve can't give a proper. Uh, so the question is basically, uh, uh, what is the how, what is the impact on higher interest rates uh, on inflation? Frankly, no one really can give a, a pinpoint a number. The lag could be twelve months, twenty four months, uh, because the interest rates only moved in March of last year. So we already got like one and a half years, and so far it hasn't really. Uh, impacted the economy as much as the Federal Reserve would think because it's supposed to work with the lag. Uh, but our own view is that uh, because there's our own view that is that uh, inflation is going to be stubborn this time around because employment is still very strong and the impact of interest rates to the economy is not as immediate as, as expected because like well, most of the housing loans, commercial, comm most of the loans are actually locked in the rates for quite some time. Uh, housing loan in the US can be like 20, locked in for 20 years uh, or 15, 20 years. I'm not have the exact number. Or even some to 10 years. So the impact to the consumer is not so immediate unless they sell the house. For the corporates also, I, I, I don't have the exact number, but also corporates loans, also the, the elevated average loans could be like five years, six years. So they don't also get the impact. So that's why the impact is not immediate. And that's why the final point is, uh, that is the worry we have. Because the economy is not slowing as sharp, especially labor market, the Federal Reserve will keep rates much longer than before, and this will only push the economy, uh, keep the growth for, for global economies weaker than longer. Because usually, when the economy is weak, the Fed will start to cut rates, and then you get the usual rebound. But because of inflation this time around, we think interest rates will just stay long, longer because in, there's an inflation issue now compared to last few times. I know the last twenty years we never had a real inflation problem, so. Uh, sorry, it's a very long answer, but what we think is that this growth is going to be slow for longer. Uh, uh, longer than everyone expects a rebound in 2024, but we think any rebound could only happen in second half 24. I mean, that's our own uh, view. 
Um, uh, Paul, to gain exposure to bonds, do you suggest direct investments or ETS or bond funds? Uh, okay, so for direct investments, the minimum bite size is 250,000. Uh, definitely ETFs are no way to buy, no way bonds are, because ETFs, you, when you buy, you are buying an NAV. Then when you sell, you so get your NAV. But you know, with bond funds, there's a spread. <laughs> so if you buy today and you sell tomorrow, you might lose. I'm not sure what's the spread now, maybe 3 to 5%. For doing you, so when you, the day you bought the fund, you probably lost money because when you want to sell back, you know, most of the unit trusts, they all have a bid and ask spread. So you will get hurt quite badly from it. So for me in general, uh, ETS is always the cheaper way because you don't have to, when you want to sell, you can sell back NAV, buy NAV, but for bonds, I mean, you, you can ask any of your FAs. Uh, there's a bit ask spread, uh, you lose out. Uh. So all these bond funds, when they tell you they're switching uh, or with no cost, there is a lot of cost inside because there's a bit and ask spread. And that is why, I mean, you're talking about bond fund, the bond yield may be 5%. You do this switching spread, you might lose all your returns. Uh. I'm not sure what's the exact spread. I didn't really check now. Yeah. I uh, hope that answers. Uh, why will my share price is dropping? Um, I, I think palm oil prices was, a, was, was one factor. I think not only that. I think last year palm oil price was 6,000, now about 4,000. So that, and also China is, is weakening. So the sentiment over China is also not helping. Uh, I mean, we don't cover, so I think these are some of the, the, the reasons. Uh, uh, Aztec, I really can't comment on Aztec because they didn't allow us to join. I, I mean, they didn't allow me to join at least for their briefing. Yeah. So I, I, I mean, I don't know why they always exclude me. So I never attended any of the, I think the last few briefings. I'm not sure why. <laughs> yeah, okay. So sorry, I can't really comment on, on Aztec. Uh, I'll answer this last one and hand it over to Zane. Uh, hi, Paul. Sorry, you said there is a 90% chance of a rate cut. Yeah, so, so sorry, my apologies. What I mean was a 90% chance of a rate hike. So my, so sorry if I uh, mentioned it uh, wrongly. Yeah. So in the upcoming meeting on 26th of July, there's a rate, 90% probability, this is the futures market. So it's almost a done deal. There's a rate hike, 25 basis points. Yeah, so sorry if I if I accidentally say it's a rate cut. My apologies for that. Uh, hand it over to you, Zane. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Paul. Uh, I'll start with, start with uh, Capital Corp. So I'll go, on, I'll go on in chronological order and I'll try my best to cover as much as I can. So for Capital Corp, I think for now, might be trading in a range. So uh, recently, after the test of around 6 to 690 to about 7, there's, a, there's some sort of a resistance over here. Price has pulled back and currently retesting this, this key level around 670, which was a previous resistance we broke out from. Uh, this happens to be around the 20-day moving average as well. So we see if price is able to support over here, we could see a bit of rebound to test this uh, short-term high equals to 7 again. Uh, if not, we could be heading down to closer to about 650 to 660 over here. Uh, something to take note of also, there's a uh, bearish divergence on the MECD as well. So some some weak, some uh, weakening momentum for capital in, in the short term. And for the next one will be uh, Fraser's Hospitality Trust. I think for Fraser's Hospitality, nothing much still going on, still very much in the range over here. The support still remains the same around 46 cents. Uh, resistance about the first level is at 47.5 cents and next level around 48.5 cents. So I think nothing much has changed for like past three months over here. Okay, then next one will be uh, Agricultural Bank of China. I think for now, there's some little bit of a weakness uh, shown recently uh, since price has made a has failed, has broken down of the range, also made a lower low recently. Uh, currently sitting in a range over here. So if the price does actually go up, uh, break out of two, these uh, highs around 2, 268, could potentially retest the resistance at 275 over here. Okay, then the next one is uh, Woko Land. Okay, for Goko Land, I think when you look at the, the big picture wise, the key support is still holding at around 150. But uh, especially uh, this year wise, you can see lower highs being formed and lower lows. So, so over here is like a bearish uh, trend that is taking place. So for now, I expect some sort of range trading to potentially retest the lows uh, support around 150, 151 again. 
since price also uh, faced resistance 157 recently. Yeah. Next one will be uh, Food Empire. Okay, Food Empire, I think uh, it's a nice uh, bullish trend. So price broke up and broke the previous high, 1, 1, 12, 113. Uh, currently just forming a range over here. So if price is able to find support over here, could potentially retest the recent highs at 118 over here again. Uh, if not, we could see a little bit lower to test the support at 107 to about 110 uh, for Food Empire. And for Delphi, I think I mentioned just on my slide, but uh, for now, it's still, the update is that uh, it's still trending well. After the breakout, it's just consolidating in the range. So I think some price stays above this level, around 130 over here. This resistance we broke out of, it will still be nice and probably can make another attempt of this recent resistance and see whether we can trade higher afterwards. So the chart still looks all right. Okay, the next one is uh, Genting Singh. Okay, Genting for now looks like uh, after the break of this wedge over here, price hasn't been able to break past these 96 cents over here. So it decided to do this hard breakdown a little bit. So some, some concern will be this breakdown of 94 cents over here, this level, which is a support. And currently it's retesting this wedge over here. So for now, the key part will be around 93 cents. 92.5 to 193 cents uh, must be able to hold over here and rebound. If not, it could get a little bit bearish and go down back into the wedge to test the lower end of the support around 90.5 cents to 91.5 cents over here. Okay, uh, there's some questions on US counters. I think I will, I will cover it later at 9, uh, 8 p.m. There's a US technical session later. Yeah, I'll focus on the Singapore and Hong Kong questions now. Uh, next one is Hong Leong Finance. Okay, Hong Leong Finance, I think, currently uh, still trading in the wedge over here. Price just very range currently. Uh, so I would expect that to continue support still likely at 250 around here or resistance likely to come in about 255 onwards about 257 for now. So I think currently nothing much. Uh, next one will be DBS. <coughs> okay, for DBS currently uh, gaining some bit of momentum in terms of the MACD trending upwards, higher highs and higher lows. Uh, price uh, broke out of this range at 31.80 and tested the swing high at 32.80. For now, might see a little bit of a consolidation for now. Uh, support could be coming at around 32.20 to about 32 for 32.40 over here. Yep. So I will expect some bit of consolidation uh, this week for DBS. And next one is uh, OCBC. And also the OCBC um quite choppy recently. We had a, the this short term break below this support level, and then it went, it had a strong rally upwards to test the, the swing high over here at 1260, just close to 1270 again. So for now, could see a little bit of consolidation as well. Uh current support would likely be this level at 1240s to 1250 over here. And I think I'll just touch on UOB as well. UOB also rebounded a bit similar to OCBC. There was a bit, uh, some sort of a, a break below the, the swing low and recovered quickly. Price is currently retesting this uh, trend line over here. So could be some sideways trading as well. See whether uh, this level at 2830 is able to hold this, this resistance is able to hold as support. If it does, then price could potentially trade higher to test next level around close to $29 over here. The next one is uh, Jardine CNC. Okay, so for Jardine wise, I think nothing much has changed. Still, price is still hovering in a very uh, range over here. So for now, some expect I will expect support coming in around 3270 to about um probably 3320 over here, this swing lows. I think that will still continue to trade in the range. Uh 
Next one is uh, ASTEC Global. Okay, as I thought the results today had a gap up and uh, price ready to test this uptrend channel resistance around 77 cents. Uh, there's also short term resistance coming close to 78 cents, which was a previous support over here that was broken. So I expect uh, probably limited upside for now, I think, for, for ASTEC since uh, it was a rally towards the resistance today. And next one is Franklin. I think Franklin currently probably we might be seeing some bit of a consolidation still. Uh, price is still supported at the 87 cents level, but has been making lower highs. So it could be consolidating a descending triangle, descending triangle for now. So uh could be still kept in this, this consolidation. Um current resistance could be around 91 cents over here. But if price breaks below this support, we could see. Maybe test uh, 85 cents next as a next support. Uh, next one will be yen lot. I think yen lot looking a bit bearish uh, for now. Price um, start, might be starting to uh, break below this 75 cents uh, support level. Uh, MACD also showing some bearish momentum wise. So with that, we could be seeing some. Some uh, retest of 72 cents, which was like uh, the swing lows back. There's some swing lows back in uh, 2015, 2016. If we do break below uh, 75 cents over here. Okay, then for iFast. IFAS currently, I think, still trending in this um, uptrend channel over here. So uh, for now, recently, it still managed to hold above the 475 resistance it had broken out of. So if price is able to stand above, still some good signs to potentially test maybe $5 next, which is this swing high, a psychological level as well as the uptrend channel resistance over here. MACD also trending uh, pretty okay currently. Okay, then AEM will be next. AEM currently, um, there's a potential break, short term break of this. So there's a potential break of this short term uh, uptrend line support over here today. Uh, price is resisted at around 390 still. Uh, MECD we're seeing uh, some uh, lower highs being made uh, during this consolidation. So if that, we could potentially see some uh, test of the lower supports. But first level around 370 over here. Uh, if it holds, then we could see a little bit of a range trade going on for AEM. Okay, then next one is uh, STI. So for the index wise, um, there was a break above this, this trend line over here, this blue purple color um, trend line resistance at 3250. Uh, we tested 3277 this swing high and currently probably just could do a little bit of a consolidation over here for now. If we are able to stand above this, this resistance that we broke out of around 3240, 3250, we could see STI head higher. Yeah. So but for now, let's see how it how it trades this week. My next will be um, <clears throat> uh, this HSI Management Tech Index ETF. I think for this, still very much in the range over here. Uh, price we tested uh, this level at $4 for now. If it's able to hold, we should see a little bit of a rebound to about uh, 4.14 to about 4.23. Uh, if it don't, then we likely will test this um, 3.8 uh, support level again. Okay, next one is uh, first resources. I think first resources price sideways after um, encountering resistance at 152, this trend line over here as well as this swing high. So uh, if it's able to hold at this level at 146, this support level, then it could potentially just trade in a very tight range 
uh, over here, 146 or 150. If it doesn't, then it will head down to the next, um, the next support level, which is around 143 over here, this breakout we had. Um, next one is uh, MLT. So for Maple Tree Logistics, price is still trading in the range over here, still very much in the range. Um, some bullish divergence building up. So we can see higher highs and higher lows being formed for MACD is still looking positive. So if price, let's say we're able to form a higher low, somewhat uh, 165 is able to hold as previous resistance and support. And potentially we could see maybe like a uh, price trip start to form higher lows and attempt the, the resistance at 122 again. LHN. Okay, LHN, uh, we tested, we are in, we are still trading in the uptrend channel for now, tested the channel resistance at 40 cents, currently pulling back to 37.5 cents, which was a previous resistance, still acting as a support over here. So if you do bounce off from here, we could expect some repairs of the recent resistance close to the 40 cent mark. Uh, if you don't, and we break down, uh, we could see maybe price go down a little bit lower to maybe 36 cents, which is the channel support over here. Uh, something to take note for average and uh, price went up, but MACU going down. Uh, so negative average divergence taking place uh, could be lacking a little bit of momentum for now. Uh, maybe I just cover one more TA question before I hand back my time to for some of the other questions. Uh, next one is Thompson Medical. Uh, can we hold or sell? Okay, for Thompson Medical, I think looking at the big trend, right? Um, it's still bounded very much in this um downtrend channel over here. So, and then uh, in the short term wise, it's just trading in this uh, range over here. It's between um, 5.8 cents to about close to 6.5 cents over here. So for now, so the MAC wise, is, you can see it's pretty flattish also. So not much momentum going on. So likely, I would think, still will likely continue in a range trade for now. So depends on, I think depends on your entry price if it's, if it's low and you're looking at um, uh, to hold it, I think for now, it's likely to trade in a range. So I think you can pretty much uh, hold on to it for now. Uh, I, if it's high, then I think you could probably sell back and maybe time for a lower entry if you're interested. Yeah, so I think for now, likely still continue in this uh, range trade for over here. Yeah, so that's all for me now. I'll pass back on my time for my other colleagues for some other questions in the chat. Okay, uh, I think we are coming up to, to 1 p.m. So, so uh, sorry, I got cut off earlier. So let me just answer this last one. Uh, so, so thanks thanks for, for, for clarifying. I said, uh, Paul, most unit trusts don't have spread anymore. We buy, sell at NAV without brokerage, except management fee may be higher. Yeah, maybe, yeah, uh, that, yeah, that is true. Maybe I keep on looking at the Great Eastern unit trust. It's always a bit us spread, but the others, if they don't have BR space, they might have subscription fee uh, if you are going to buy. Uh, so you might have to pay an upfront subscription fee if you're buying a bond fund. Uh, I'm not an expert in this, but, but this could be some of the, the other charges. Uh, uh, not to mention, like the, the person mentioned, there's a higher uh, management fee. Some as high as 1.5, I've seen some. But anyway, uh, it, it depending, you have to check between the ETF and also the fund. Uh, but the problem is also the subscription fee, I guess. Uh, I think with that, we really hit one o'clock. We, we try to end at one. Uh, there might be some questions we may not have answered. Uh, we'll try to uh, put the question and the answer in an, our in in our uh, poems three community chat and and hopefully uh, you can read it over there too. Uh, and apologize if we can't take them. We try to end it by one p.m. So so with that, I'd like to thank everyone for for your time, uh, especially your questions and and, and some comments. So, so thank, thanks a lot for that. Uh, that, uh, wish everyone to have a, a great week ahead. Uh, this week, a lot of news out there, a lot of results. But anyway, thanks everyone for your time and hope to see you again uh, next week. Thank you.